And I feel still like half the job of directing or doing it, creating any of these films is just making sure the audience can read what's going on in the characters' brains, you know, so that you know you're in step with them and understand where they're going, what they want. That's like half the battle. I just loved doing animation and I pictured myself in, in college. I was thinking, what do I want to do? Well, I picture myself, you know, sitting at one of those old style animation drawing desks with the circle and you're drawing Mickey Mouse. That's what I was th thought I would probably do for my life. Um, and so when I started at Pixar, it was really kind of like, I was a kid who would take apart tape recorders and stuff, you know, just to see how they worked. So it, to me, it was kind of itching that same scratch of like, or scratching that same itch of figuring out how do they do this? How do they make these films that look so different than anything I've ever seen before. Um, and so that's, I think, a large part of why I started there. And one thing led to another. I, I was not planning to be a director. Uh, I was not planning to be a leader. I was planning to just sit in the corner and animate. And so along the way, and I think this happens with everything, is that your success in one area is you're rewarded by being shoved into some area that you know nothing about, right? And so suddenly you're like, crap, now what? I have to lead this team. In fact, literally on Toy Story, um, one of the animators back then, not to make this all about like old man stuff, but nobody, we, I think there were, two, we had a staff of 27 animators. So I was supervising animator. Only two of them had used a computer before. So all of uh, a lot of the job was teaching people how to do this and one of them this guy named bud lucky he was in his 50s he literally did um short films that i watched on sesame street as an infant so he taught me how to read and now i'm supposed to tell him what to do that was that was not something i was prepared for uh, but you know that's how life goes It's different at different places, but at Pixar, we basically choose people based on them. So we're like, all right, we're not buying your idea. It's not about the idea. It's like we see potential in you based on work you've done. So you come into development, pitch, develop a bunch of stuff and pitch it, usually three ideas. Um, and out of those three ideas, generally there's one that people will gravitate towards and will say, great, go ahead. So that's your that's your green light. The gun goes off. So now uh, you go into development and it's usually you, the director. Um, pretty quickly, we try to grab an, uh, another story artist or a uh, story, uh, sorry, uh, a writer to help. And then you're shepherding the whole thing along. So um, it's usually about a five-year process, believe it or not, from that first the gun goes off to the point it comes out in theaters. I'd say the first three years are pretty almost exclusively writing centric, developing the world, the characters, um, you know, trying to make something that's compelling that people want to watch. We do scripts. Yes, we do scripts. But for us, writing is largely it comes in the form of storyboarding. So we have a small team of seven people or so who draw the whole film out. We put those along with dialogue, music and sound effects um, and we screen it. So we basically we even go so far as like at the beginning, you know, how there's the lamp and the, the castle logo. We put those on the front just to say <laughs> we're fooling ourselves. This is good. We're going to hypnotize ourselves. This is a real movie. And then you sit and you watch all these chicken scratches uh, uh, drawings with with bad actors like me doing the voice. Um, but it's enough to give you a sense for the story, the arc of the character. Is this an interesting idea? Does anybody care? And then you go back and you change it as a result of that. So we have, by the time it comes out in theaters, we're generally, we have screened it for ourselves that way between seven and 10 times. But it's also weird because we're essentially editing the film before we shoot it. So by the time I go to an animator and say, hey, can you create this shot and here's what happens, I know exactly not only what the dialogue is, but how long it is to the frame, you know, and what it's cutting from and what it's cutting to. So it's all mapped out. Uh, and I do feel like, man, film is this amazing thing where we as filmmakers can connect in the dark with strangers that we will never meet through this stuff that we're making, you know, making these stories. It's, it's a uh, kind of miraculous. Um, and I, you know, I don't know about you. I, I also feel like a lot of the reason that we do this, well, I'll speak for myself anyway. 
uh, is that there is a sense in everyday life, I'm going to get heavy here all of a sudden, that, that, that we're alone, that we're walking through this whole existence alone. And films and stories are a reminder that we're not, that we're connected to other people, that we're all going through the same thing. And um, that's pretty powerful stuff. I mean, I, I'll say most of the films I've done start from a very surface level. What would be cool? That's kind of what I'm saying to myself. Like, what do I want to animate? What do I want to see on the screen? Monsters. Yeah, monsters. I'm not really thinking any more than that. Uh, emotions. Yeah, okay. In my mind, emotions are like, oh, I could do some really extreme character stuff that could no, not be done in any other way. Uh, that'll be cool. That's kind of the level to which I'm going. And then as we get into it, and I think this is probably you could take any subject in the world. Uh, okay, I'm just going to make that declarative statement. Uh, you could take any subject and find something deep in it, something that resonates with you, that makes, and, and the thing I'm always looking for is like, what have I suffered <laughs> uh, with? Uh, and, and that seems like, oh, that's a negative way to look at it. But usually along with suffering is some sort of success and joy. Um, but I guess my point is, you don't want it to be an easy thing, not something like, oh, one time I thought I should take this job, but I wasn't sure if I should take that job instead. And then I chose this, the end. Like, no, you want it to be like somehow emblematic of something deeper that you have struggled with, that has caused you grief or pain. Uh, and that way, you know, it has weight, you know. So um, I don't know that I'm consciously going for like as a writer looking for what's the where's the hurt where's the heavy stuff but um i think subconsciously i am so you know something like soul was of course kind of built in as soon as you talk about like who are we at the core how much of that was born we were we born with what are we here for like it, you just like you can't help but go <laughs> to all that stuff so um that was really ripe in a lot of writing classes and books like find your theme and nail it to the wall and i think the the yes but the problem with that is it implies that somehow the theme is going to reveal itself before the material does and i find the theme reveals itself in the material as i write in other words my lizard brain is way smarter than my frontal lobe so if i sit here and go here's my movie intellectually i'm going to come up with something stupid but if i just let myself go and create uh it's going to come out and then i so this gets pretty complicated but i do feel like there is a different mental process be there's two separate processes. There's creation and there's judgment. Don't try to do them at the same time. If you're creating and judging, it's just going to shut everything down. So you have to turn that part of your brain off and just go and like, I don't know, this seems fun to me. And, and just go from an instinct of what is it that, in, that makes you excited. Then, and this is why we have this whole process uh, at Pixar where we're able to screen, is that it allows us to kind of step back and say, all right, now, what have we made? What are we doing here? Um, is this, does this make any sense? Is it actually engaging and interesting or did it just seem like it for 15 minutes when we talked about it at lunch? We saw this, um, lecture by Herbie Hancock, great jazz mm -hmm. musician. Yeah. And he talked about playing a concert, um, with Miles Davis, you know, one of the greats. And he said, we were having a great tour and this particular concert was great. And then he said, I played this chord. And he's a pianist. He said it was so wrong that I worried I just destroyed the whole day, the whole night, and 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 was going to leave the night in rubble. And he said he looks over and Miles Davis plays some notes, and he made that chord right. And he's like, how did that happen? He said that it took him years to figure out. What he did was, he said, Herbie judged himself. He said that was a wrong chord. Miles just took it as, oh, there's something new that happened. I'm going to try and make something good out of it. And I think um, that was a real pivotal idea that, that as a musician, we don't control what goes on every, every in our, in our, in, on stage, uh, but you do have the power to turn anything that happens 
into something of value. And I felt like that's exactly what I'm trying to get to with the story. And so jazz kind of introduced itself into the story. And that then was a big ripple effect uh, in terms of a lot of decisions, location, main character, all these things came out of that one thing of like jazz is resonating for me thematically uh, in this story that I'm trying to tell. Um, that leads to all these other choices that, that came along with it.